1971, a minor miracle occurred. Sean Connery returned to play James Bond after famously quitting the role in Diamonds Are Forever. Producers had been counting on the film's success to help them relaunch the series following the disappointing box office performance of George Lazenby's solo outing on Her Majesty's Secret Service. Wanting to strike while the iron was hot, United Artists greenlit the next 007 outing, but this time Connery could not be enticed to return despite an 11th hour appeal. Thus, Harry Saltzman and Albert R. Broccoli would have to find a new person to play 007, and for a while it looked like Bond could potentially become an American, with Burt Reynolds reportedly having been offered the role, as was Clint Eastwood. Eventually, the choice was made to keep Bond British, a sensible one at that, and to that end, dozens of actors were reportedly given screen tests, including future Sherlock Holmes Jeremy Brett, Julian Glover, who would eventually play the villain in For Your Eyes Only, and Michael Billington, star of the TV show UFO, who would become a perennial favorite to take over the role. In fact, a long-standing rumor has it that Billington was always on standby to take over the part at short notice, with the closest he ever came to taking on the role being in For Your Eyes Only, 1981 where they went so far as to have publicity stills of him taken in character. In 1973, however, Broccoli and Saltzman had their sights set on a British TV star named Roger Moore who was already famous for having played the saint. A bad experience with Lazenby had temporarily put them off hiring an unknown to play the part, but Moore, who was also approached in 1967 and then again in 1971, almost didn't play the role. At the time, he was shooting an adventure show called The Persuaders with Tony Curtis, which very nearly went into a second season. Broccoli also thought Moore was a little out of shape and that his hair was too long, meaning that Moore had to hit the gym. Eventually, he saw the light and a new era in James Bond was born with Live and Let Die, despite the fact that, at 45, Roger Moore was actually three years older than Sean Connery, and much fuss had been made in 1971 about the fact that Connery was playing Bond at 40. Here, in his first Bond role, Roger Moore was already 45. By this point, however, producers Albert R. Broccoli and Harry Saltzman had bigger problems. They were barely on speaking terms and they actually had an agreement where they would alternate Bond films, meaning Saltzman was the main producer of Live and Let Die as Broccoli had done Diamonds Are Forever. The film would be an adaptation of the Ian Fleming novel. And at the time, the black exploitation genre was in vogue with movies like Shaft breaking box office records, while many black actors were emerging as stars. Thus, Live and Let Die would seem a natural fit for 1973, even if some of their ideas were met with resistance from United Artists. For one thing, Saltzman and Broccoli wanted the main Bond girl, Solitaire, to be black, as she was in the book. In fact, they wanted Diana Ross to play the part, but UA would not go along, fearing that the film would run into censorship problems in certain parts of the US and internationally. In fact, it would take all the way until 2002 before the main love interest was played by a black actress, with Holly Berry starring as Jinx in Die Another Day. As a compromise, the secondary Bond girl, Rosie Carver, who was originally supposed to be white, was made black. Newcomer Jane Seymour would end up playing Solitaire, while former Playboy Club bunny Gloria Hendry would play Rosie. The premise called for Bond to be pitted against a Harlem drug lord named Mr. Big, who's somehow in league with the dictator of a small island called San Monique, Dr. Kananga, who's tied to the murder of three MI6 agents. Kananga would be played by the celebrated actor Yafit Koto, who had just co-starred with Anthony Quinn in United Artists' hit film Across 110th Street. Much of the film would be shot in the American South, and the Bond producers and director Guy Hamilton, who was returning from Diamonds Are Forever, were brought face to face with the virulent racism of the area, which was particularly problematic as most of the supporting cast was black. With Koto's encouragement, Saltzman opted to cast black stuntmen, which was progressive for the time as infamously many stuntmen in the 60s and early 70s wore blackface to double black actors. This put Hamilton and Saltzman in the crosshairs of some Louisiana cops, who apparently were about to refuse them shooting permits for the car chase and boat chase because black drivers were to be used. Saltzman, not one to back down from a challenge, simply said fine, we'll take our hundreds of thousands of dollars elsewhere. Naturally, the cops backed down, but screenwriter Tom Mankiewicz couldn't resist including a stereotypical heck sheriff named J.W. Pepper into the plot as a way of mocking the pushback they got. Which in turn backfired because the character, as played by Clifton James, ended up being surprisingly lovable and became so popular with audiences that they had to bring him back for the sequel. What are you? Some kind of doomsday machine boy! One of the most interesting accounts of the production comes from Roger Moore himself, who was allowed to keep a diary which was then published as a paperback. In it, Moore is hilariously un-PC, complaining about the producers, his kidney stones, arguments with his wife, and of course some of the racist locals. 
He also writes about his trepidation taking over as James Bond, and there's a knockout part in the book where Roger Moore actually goes into a theory about how JFK was killed and his belief that Lee Harvey Oswald didn't act alone. Why was Kennedy killed? Who benefited? Who has the power to cover it up? It's quite the read. The film itself is a pretty interesting watch as Moore is clearly finding his way here and hasn't adjusted to the part as he would later on. So let's break it down. The script for Live and Let Die is once again written by Tom Mankiewicz. While I have nothing but respect for what he brought to his later scripts for Superman and Ladyhawk, with him particularly having a great working relationship with Richard Donner, Mankiewicz has an annoying habit in his scripts of going for this cringy Hepcat dialogue that's painfully dated. This was evident in a big way in Diamonds Are Forever. He does it again here. Yafit Koto complained that the scripts was full of haymans and jive turkeys, as Mank didn't quite know how to write for black characters. But the dialogue isn't too bad, at least not for the era. At least, anyway, when it's Koto talking, because he's so smooth and sophisticated you kind of buy it, at least while he's playing Kananga. Mr. Big is another story, but he's supposed to be kind of a cartoon character, I suppose. My name is James is for tombstones, baby. Y'all take this honky out and waste him, now! Bond also takes on a bit of a sleazy, swain 60s vibe when he cons Solitaire into sleeping with him through rigged tarot cards. Bond doesn't need to con anyone, and the whole kind of ladies' man thing works well for more in some cases, but he has to be more smooth and sophisticated, not rough. Overall, this is kind of a weak dated entry, so I give the script about a 5 on 10. Luckily, as I said before, they have Yafit Koto around, and you can see why he became so in demand as an actor after. Although apparently there was tension on the set when he flashed a black power salute in publicity stills. Personally, I think Koto gives the most legit performance in the film. The henchman, Teehee, played by Julius Harris, is saddled with perhaps the most unconvincing prosthetic hook in screen history, although Jeffrey Holder is creepy as hell as Baron Samity. <laughs> The villains are a mixed 7 on 10. As far as the Bond girls go, eh, another mixed bag. Jean Seymour is a beautiful woman, but far too childlike and English to play solitaire, who we're supposed to believe has been raised on the island of San Monique by Koto. Gloria Hendry also has to play the klutz with Rosie Carver, and it's a very thin part, but she looks good and you can see why she was a playboy bunny. I give the Bond girls a 6 on 10, but not through any fault of the actresses themselves. It's the writing that lets them down. One area the film really does excel at though, and I have to give it to them, is the action with some hair-raising chases, including a long set piece that begins with an insane stunt when Bond escapes from an alligator farm run by the real-life Ross Kananga, who everyone liked so much his name was adopted for the main villain. It climaxes in a wild speedboat chase, which is deservedly a classic. For the first time in the series, John Barry is not back to do the score, with him only scoring every second film throughout most of the 70s for tax reasons, with Beatles producer George Martin contributing a fine, action-driven rock score. So, why George Martin? Why indeed, with the film having a theme song written by none other than Paul McCartney and performed by Paul McCartney in Wings, which has gone on to become a classic. Oddly enough, Harry Saltzman actually didn't care for the song and wanted a female singer instead of McCartney, although Moore advised him not to look a gift horse in the mouth, and of course the song has become an all-time classic and forever associated with the Bond franchise. As far as gadgets go, Q sits this one out with M giving Bond the movie's big gadget, a watch magnet. Yeah, nothing too fancy this time. And of course in this scene you actually see Bond's bachelor pad and oh yes, he's entertaining a lady. The kill count in this one is a low 7, including the all-time franchise worst Bond villain death, which seems like it was ripped out of an Ed Wood movie. <laughs> How did this ever, ever stay in the film? Even Yafit Koto said that this death was rubbish. Correct again, Mr. Bond. What a quick study you are. As you could probably tell, Live and Let Die is not one of my favorite Bond films, although I admit it's perfectly watchable. While I make no bones about the fact that Moore is probably my favorite Bond nostalgia-wise, his first couple of movies were rocky, and he didn't really make the part his own until The Great Spy Who Loved Me, meaning we have another not-so-great Bond film to get through. I give this a 6 on 10 overall. I don't mind it, but it's not one of the movies that I return to the most. Audiences loved it though, and it still has a big following. Roger Moore himself said it was his second favorite Bond film, so... I guess maybe I'm not particularly right in this case. It was a big box office smash, bigger even than Diamonds Are Forever, grossing $161 million worldwide. And this is on a significantly reduced budget, which is evident by the film's flat aspect ratio, the first time this was actually used since Goldfinger. Truly, Roger Moore was here to stay, but in their haste to reinforce his position as Bond, United Artists pushed Eon Films into making perhaps the biggest Bond fiasco ever, although that's a tale for another time on James Bond Revisited.
In 1973, United Artists successfully launched Roger Moore as the new James Bond in Live and Let Die, a film that actually managed to outgross its Sean Connery starring predecessor, Diamonds Are Forever, by over $40 million worldwide. Clearly audiences more, more, then accepted Raj as the new 007, spurring a bullish United Artist to order Albert R. Broccoli and Harry Saltzman's Eon Productions to rush out a follow-up for release within 18 months to hit theaters by Christmas of 1974. The resulting film would be the final nail in the coffin for the fraying relationship between Broccoli and Saltzman and jeopardize the series itself in the wake of disappointing box office and poor reviews in a film that many, including Roger Moore himself, have dubbed one of the worst James Bond films ever made. And that movie is The Man with the Golden Gun. Given that Eon had to jump right into the film, the creative team from Live and Let Die, which had handled Diamonds Are Forever, was initially left intact. Guy Hamilton would be back to direct the film in his fourth Bond outing, while Tom Mankiewicz would write the script, although after a few drafts, he would drop out and be replaced by returning veteran Richard Maybaum. Opting to adapt Ian Fleming's final Bond novel, The Man with the Golden Gun, the film very nearly got made in the late 60s in Cambodia, although of course that location was scrapped with this being the era of the Cambodian Civil War dramatized in the killing fields. Instead, the film would be mostly shot in Hong Kong and Thailand, with the majority of the book being scrapped in favor of a then topical plot, which would deal with the energy crisis by making the MacGuffin a device that could harness the power of the sun. Unlike other Bond films that would pit 007 against an army of baddies, here Bond would have to face off with a villain whose skills equaled his own, the world's top assassin, Francisco Scaramanga, who is aided by his valet, Knickknack, played by a pre-fantasy island, Hervé Villachez. His love interest would be Britt Eklund's Club Z agent, Mary Goodnight. Probably the most important role to be cast other than Bond was Scaramanga, and the role was written for Jack Palance, with the idea that the role would be a homage to the villain he played in Shane. Palance turned it down, and they had the inspired idea to hire Christopher Lee, who was actually Ian Fleming's step-cousin and, like him, a former World War II intelligence agent. He was then at the height of his fame thanks to a series of Hammer horror films that cast him as Dracula, and for him, Scaramanga was a treat, as he got to play a somewhat sympathetic, classy, and urbane villain. Moore, of course, had fun with Lee throughout the shoot, quipping when they entered a cave full of bats, Master, they're yours to command. Lee himself always said that it was a role that he loved doing, even if every day he had to get a full body spray tan, plus the addition of a third nipple, which figures heavily into the plot. The Bond girls, Britt Eklund and Maude Adams were both Swedes and would apparently joke around in Swedish on the set. Meanwhile, Hervé Villachez was apparently living it up in Thailand, keeping the local brothels busy and constantly bringing prostitutes to the set. Moore went so far as to say that Villachez slept with something like 35 ladies of the night while they were filming and that he had some unnatural lusts. Hervé had a voracious appetite for the ladies. He really looked quite frightful for the first few hours and was asleep a good deal of the day. I think as a result of his um, efforts the night before. Unlike Live and Let Die, this time Albert R. Broccoli would be the onset producer, but in a highly publicized incident, Saltzman, who was sidelined in this one, mistakenly ordered 2,600 pairs of elephant shoes for a stampede that was cut from the script. Eklund also says there was a close call involving some explosions at the climax, saying that in the scene where Moore helps her to her feet in the midst of explosion is not actually acting. She had fallen and Moore was rescuing her. As much fun as they seem to be having behind the scenes, The Man with the Golden Gun ranks as the only nearly irredeemable Bond film. Breaking it down, there's the script, which is juvenile at best, offensive at worst. I don't know who is to blame for this one, Mankiewicz or Maybaum, and I don't know who they thought they were writing it for, but it sure as heck wasn't Roger Moore. They try to have him play a tough guy, smacking around Maude Adams' character in her hotel room, and hopping into the sack in front of Mary Goodnight, telling her after, don't worry darling, your turn will come. With Connery in the lead, this might have worked. There was a certain aggressiveness and threat to him that audiences could take, even enjoy. Moore, however, comes off as an asshole something he complained about on the DVD commentary, saying it really wasn't until The Spy Who Loved Me that he was able to come into his own, and I'm inclined to agree. He especially hated a scene where Bond, in a rare bully moment, pushes a child into a river in Thailand that Moore says was horribly polluted, and his biography, he says that the scene makes him cringe. Or at least did until he passed away. R.I.P. Raj, we love you. The script only merits about a 4 on 10 and is saved by the characterization of Scaramanga, while Hamilton's direction is incredibly lackluster. You see, the movie as bad as it is though does have one good thing about it, and it's Scaramanga. 
Christopher Lee is very suave, so suave in fact that he feels more like James Bond than James Bond in this movie. I really like the sad story he tells about his elephant friend in the circus and how he became a gun for hire, and no one, but no one, says, come come 007, like him. Come come Mr. Bond, you enjoy the scallop just as much as I do. Please, eat. The baddie gets an eight. The Bond girls, however, are totally wasted in this one. The two Swedes, Britt Eklund and Maude Adams, are lovely, but both are wasted in thankless parts, although of course they both look great in bathing suits. Adams would eventually fare much better playing the title role in Octopussy. The Bond girls here are a 5 on 10, although I don't think you can blame either actress. The action is quite silly with requisite nods to the kung fu craze that dominated pop culture at the time, but it has to be said, Roger Moore is no Bruce Lee. <laughs> There's also a great barrel roll stunt that's ruined by the slide whistle sound effect and the fact that for some harebrained reason, they brought back Clifton James as J.W. Pepper, the racist southern sheriff from Live and Let Die, who of course would be in Thailand at the same time as James Bond, right? Okay. Bond actually only kills one guy in the entire film. Too bad it wasn't J.W. Pepper. Oh. You is ugly. The gadgets are pretty weak, with Q contributing a fake nipple, although the golden gun is pretty nifty. Apparently, Christopher Lee tried to bring it to the States so he could show it off on The Tonight Show, but US Customs weren't having it and confiscated the weapon. Boo. The John Barry score is atypically weak for the maestro, with Barry himself saying it was his worst score ever, reportedly done in a hurry with the theme song by Lulu that he was never happy with. I give it about a 6 on 10, because even John Barry at his worst is better than most composers at their best. The film itself is by far my least favorite James Bond movie, and one of the few that I cannot watch over and over again, so it only gets about a 4 on 10 for me, with it only being saved really by Christopher Lee. Audiences reacted similarly, with many saying that the advertising that went into this was incredibly lackluster, although then again, you can't polish a turd. It only made about half of what Live and Let Die did worldwide, eking out about 97 million. Now, this is far from a disaster for the time, and it was still one of the highest grossing movies of the year. It made a hefty profit, but for James Bond movies, the gross was considered very poor, leading to a complete reboot behind the scenes for the next movie. Ah, but that's a story for another time. After a promising launch for the new James Bond, Roger Moore, with Live and Let Die, the franchise found itself on shakier ground than ever after the rushed Man with the Golden Gun opened to bad reviews and middling box office over the 1974 holiday season. Most notably, it marked the end of producer Albert R. Broccoli's professional relationship with Harry Saltzman. Since founding Eon together, the two clashed mightily with things so bad between them that they would alternate producing films. In 1975, Harry Saltzman, who'd branched out into other unsuccessful ventures, including the Harry Palmer film starring Michael Caine, Battle of Britain, and even an investment in Technicolor, sold his half of the Bond franchise for 20 million pounds, meaning that Albert R. Broccoli would have to go it alone with United Artists. In addition, the Bond team, knowing that this would be a make or break film, had a hard time coming up with a suitable script. All the while, Kevin McClory was making news around town, talking up his own rival Bond film, James Bond, 
of the Secret Service, which would eventually become 1983's Never Say Never Again. Thanks to the situation with McClory, the Bond team could no longer use Spectre, who were originally set to make a comeback in this, with John Landis having apparently delivered a draft that went unused. Director Guy Hamilton dropped out to go make Superman, on which he'd later be replaced, and the decision was made to inject the series with some newish blood. Enter Lewis Gilbert, the acclaimed English director who'd previously filmed You Only Live Twice. It was his decision to bring in writer Christopher Wood to rework Richard Maybaum's script, and in turn, he also opted to substantially rework Roger Moore's characterization of James Bond, which had proved to be failing in The Man with the Golden Gun. Rather than turn him into another Sean Connery clone, the decision was made to emphasize the smooth over the rough. Broccoli decided to go all out in making this a Bond extravaganza, as opposed to the last few lower key installments. One of the big switches is that instead of shooting in the flat aspect ratio, it was now backed at 235 to 1 scope. Here the premise would revolve around a billionaire megalomaniac named Carl Stromberg, very much a Blofeld clone, whose scheme would be to instigate nuclear war so that he could build a utopian society under the sea. A new and beautiful world beneath the sea. Under the sea. Under the sea. What made this really unique for the franchise is that for the first time, Bond would be partnered with a Bond girl who was his equal, Barbara Box Anya Amasova, aka Agent Triple X. A Soviet spy, the two, predicting Glasnost, would team up to save the day, with the romance being complicated by the fact that in the film's famous ski chase opening, Bond kills Triple X's lover, who was played by Michael Billington an actor that was on retainer to take over for Bond on a number of subsequent installments should Roger Moore be unavailable or unwilling. He even got so far as to take publicity stills on the set of For Your Eyes Only. The twist would be here that Triple X, when finding out that Bond killed her lover, would swear vengeance, promising him that she's going to kill him when the mission is over. So let's break it down. In terms of scripting, I'm of the mind that this is the strongest one they had since Connery's heyday. While I still think the film's first act is more than a little clunky, with it only really taking off once Triple X and Bond team up, it has all the elements we'd consider hallmarks of the genre. The characterization of Triple X is good, really good, although my one complaint is that Stromberg's plot to establish a world under the sea is, let's face it, pretty silly. Notably, this is one of the few Bond films from that era not to have anything to do with the Ian Fleming novel it takes its name from, as that was a one-off novel that only featured James Bond as a supporting character, and was more of a character piece about a Canadian woman who encounters Bond on the road, with him rescuing her from two thugs that later take her hostage. The villains here are a mixed bag. Kurt Jurgens, a terrific actor, doesn't have a ton of screen time as Stromberg, and of course is basically playing Blofeld by another name. He spends most of the film sitting with his webbed hands so subtle that I never actually realized they were webbed until the era of DVD. However, the film does have Richard Keel as Jaws, who became an iconic Bond henchman and steals the show so much that they brought him back in Moonraker, eventually making him a good guy because kids loved him so much. Trivia, Richard Keel's steel teeth were apparently so painful that he could only wear them for a few minutes at a time. The movie made Keel an international star, and he'd re-team with co-star Barbara Bach on two more movies, Force 10 from Navarone and The Humanoid. The villains get an eight, but mostly for Jaws. Barbara Bach, while a touch stiff as an actress, is one hell of a Bond girl, with an exotic look that's just right for the lethal triple X. Her stiffness gives her an aloof quality that I think actually benefits the part, and I think in some ways she's the prototypical modern Bond girl in many ways. She gets a nine. Uh, Major, you're most welcome to use the shower in my quarters. You do not have to show me any special favors, Commander. All the same, I think it might be better if I did. Where the film really comes to life, however, is in Roger Moore's characterization of Bond. Moore seems totally comfortable playing a wisecracking, easygoing 007, and would set the tone for his approach to the character that in many ways would end up just being as iconic as Sean Connery's. Where's Peckish? Pyramids! Ah! What a helpful chap. I would say that later interpretations of the role, particularly Pierce Brosnan's, probably owe as much to Roger Moore as they do to Sean Connery's. Moore always said that this was his best Bond film, and while I do have a soft spot for a few others, particularly Octopussy, which ranks as one of my favorite films in the franchise, objectively I'm inclined to agree. Another thing that's great in this movie are the gadgets, with this introducing the second greatest James Bond car of all time, the Lotus Esprit, which transforms into a mini-sub and is now apparently owned by Elon Musk. The car alone merits a 10. Q, have I ever let you down? Frequently. 
The action in the film is outstanding, with the opening ski chase concluding with Rick Sylvester's famous ski jump that's become one of the most iconic images of all time as the Union Jack parachute opens up. Apparently, at the world premiere screening of this in the UK, audiences rose to their feet cheering, including Prince Charles. I especially like the climax aboard La Paris, which is the biggest interior set of all time, and was so hard to light that the production designer, Ken Adam, had to bring in none other than Stanley Kubrick to consult. You see, the problem was that the DP, Claude Renoir, was beginning to go blind during principal photography, so they needed all the help they could get. The production design on this film would get a much-deserved Oscar nomination. The final battle royale between the submarine crews and Stromberg's men ranks as one of the best, most well-choreographed action scenes in Bond history, and I think that this was Lewis Gilbert's strength as a director. He really knew how to do these huge battle sequences. See the ninja volcano fight in You Only Live Twice, and then in Moonraker, the space laser fight, which is not quite as cool as, you know, submarine crews and ninjas, but isn't bad. The kill count on this one is pretty high. 007 taking 31 lives, one of the highest in the series up to that point. The score for this is quite different from other Bond films, with John Barry unable to return due to tax reasons, resulting in his replacement with one of the most popular composers of the era, the Oscar-winning Marvin Hamlish, whose disco-tinged remake of the Bond theme, Bond 77, would become a worldwide dance hit, and in some ways, quite iconic. It's a dated but fun score that landed him an Oscar nomination. If the movie is known for anything, though, it's definitely the theme song by Carly Simon. Nobody Does It Better, which is probably one of the two or three best Bond songs ever written, was robbed at the Oscars. It got a nomination, but how did it not win? For that alone, this gets a 9 on 10. The film itself, I think, merits a strong 9 in my book. Objectively, it's one of the better Bonds, although I maintain that the first act is a little bit slow. Never mind. Audiences absolutely love this film, with it a big hit, doubling the box office of The Man with the Golden Gun and re-establishing Roger Moore as his heir as James Bond. Notably, the end of the film teed it up for your eyes only, but one of the films that The Spy Who Loved Me competed with at the box office, Star Wars, would change Bond history forever. But alas, that, my friends, is a story for another time. 007, triple X. Bond, what do you think you're doing? Keeping the British hand up, sir. Thank you for watching our show. If you like what you see, please subscribe to Joe Blow Videos and tell your friends who like this sort of content to turn on the bell to receive notifications for all of our latest videos. We're an independent company and we appreciate all your support. While the release of The Man with the Golden Gun very nearly spilled doom for the James Bond franchise as a whole, 1977's The Spy Who Loved Me, which grossed $185 million worldwide, put the Bond franchise back on top and firmly established Roger Moore as the 007 of his era. Now, originally, the film was intended to be followed by For Your Eyes Only, which was originally teased at the end of Spy Who Loved Me, but the same summer that movie came out, a little film you may have heard of came out called Star Wars. All of a sudden, every studio in town was coming out with their own sci-fi epic, movies that included Star Trek, The Motion Picture, The Black Hole, Alien, and of course, Battlestar Galactica, which was actually a TV pilot that they released as a movie. In order to stay competitive, Albert R. Broccoli, who is now producing the series solo, decided he had to make his own sci-fi epic by launching everyone's favorite super spy into space, Moonraker. I know that a lot of James Bond fans have a big problem with this movie, but hear me out, it kinda works, but it wouldn't work with anybody except for Roger Moore as James Bond. I mean, look, I don't even really know where to begin with this one. Obviously, the success of Star Wars couldn't be ignored, but I don't really understand why Broccoli thought it was a good idea to bring Bond into space. The very idea would have probably had Ian Fleming turning in his grave, but Broccoli figured I'm sure that the space gimmick would bring in a few extra bucks, and he was right, because for a while, Moonraker 
was the highest grossing James Bond movie of all time. In fact, that record was held until GoldenEye came out in 1995. Back in 1979 though, sending James Bond into space was not an easy thing to do. In order to have cutting edge special effects and to hire a company like Industrial Light and Magic, ILM, that would have meant that the producers would have had to have given up a massive chunk of the gross. In fact, this very thing happened when Abu Dhabi Broccoli went to ILM for help. Thus, the Bond production crew really had to do all the special effects work in-house. This would prove to be a very costly venture, with the finished film coming in at $34 million, which was $20 million more than what the previous film cost, and that was a lavish James Bond outing, and three times what it cost to make Star Wars. Even $4 million more than the first Star Trek film, which at its time was considered a very costly flop. In order to save money, the decision was made to move the shoot to France where the producers could catch a tax break. They also raised some cash by loading the film with as much product placement as possible. At one point, James Bond is going down a mountain road on a gurney and he goes past three separate billboards selling three separate products before finally sending the henchmen he's fighting through a fourth. It's a pretty silly scene, and even Lewis Gilbert, who returned to direct this film after doing Spy Who Loved Me, said in the DVD commentary that it was all a little bit much. But with so much money being put into the space footage, the rest of the film unfortunately does feel a bit like an afterthought. The lavish look of The Spy Who Loved Me is gone. Rather, the first two thirds of this movie kind of looks a little cheap with its soft focus lensing, which is very much of the time. The look of the film is only really dazzling once they get into space, and I have to give it to them. The special effects for the time are actually quite good. Now, while they're on Earth, there are some good moments. There's a really good sword fight about halfway through the movie, and there's a great gondola chase, although it's ruined by the now infamous hashtag pigeon double take. Yes, it's a pigeon. He does a double take. So, as I said, the special effects for the era pretty good, and Derek Mettings, who was in charge of them, received an Academy Award nomination for his work, but of course they lost to Alien, and I have to say, you look at the special effects in Alien, and you can kind of understand why. As it stands, Moonraker, I would say, is probably the dumbest installment of the series, and it hasn't really aged well, but it's kind of a fun film in its own right. In fact, I watched this movie on 35mm some years ago at a midnight screening, pretty drunk, and... We all had a blast watching the movie. I mean, was it dumb? Sure, it was dumb, but it was kind of fun. And I think that's really the way to watch this movie. If you watch it as a really silly James Bond movie, and there are very few that are sillier, it's a cut above the worst installments of the series. Play it again, son. It's fun in a I can't believe this was actually made kind of way. And I'm sure that one day they'll do it on how this get made, because if ever a James Bond movie called out for their attention, this is the one. Now granted, the film is essentially a remake of The Spy Who Loved Me in Space, minus a lot of the excitement, so it looks like Lewis Gilbert and writer Christopher Wood and Richard Maybaum kind of recycled what they had going on the last one, but you know what, they had to focus on the special effects, so I get it. It has its good points, and I have to say, Roger Moore gives it its all. I give the script for this one a uh, pretty standard maybe 5 on 10, although Christopher Wood has some good dialogue, especially when it's coming out of Michelle Lonsdale's mouth, such as the great line, Look after Mr. Bond. See that some harm comes to him. As for James Bond himself, I think Roger Moore actually gives a great performance, and I don't think this movie would work with anybody but Roger Moore in the lead. You see, Roger Moore is kind of silly, raises an eyebrow, doesn't take it all too seriously. If Roger Moore was in this, he would seem like he was so embarrassed the movie would be almost unwatchable. Roger Moore, he takes it in stride. Yes, in space, it's really good. It's a testament to his likability in the role that he actually manages to make the idea of James Bond in a space shoot suiting laser guns kind of work. Now, as far as the Bond villains go, there's a pretty good one in this one. Michelle Lonsdale, who is an actor who died recently and has been in tons of movies like Day of the Jackal, The Name of the Rose, is on board as Hugo Drax, who is basically a ripoff of the previous film's Carl Stromberg. Lonsdale's okay, but he does seem a little bit like the movies at arm's length. Like, he knows this is silly, he's accepting a paycheck, he's moving on. I like his look and I think he's a great actor, but mm, not sure he's the best villain that they've had. <laughs> Heartbroken, Mr. Drax. Take a giant step for mankind. Where are 
where's Drax? Oh, he had to fly. But of course, Richard Keel returns to the series as Jaws, but this time the character has been given much more screen time considering how popular he was in The Spy Who Loved Me, and he even kind of gets a love interest in the form of Dolly, a petite blonde with superhuman strength. An incredibly stupid move, Jaws, who was formerly a mass murderer, becomes a good guy towards the end of the film, and teams up with Bond and Goodhead to stop Drax. The reason for this is that children loved him so much they sent in letter after letter to Eon Productions, begging them to make Jaws a goodie. Mercifully, the character did not return in For Your Eyes Only. I give the villains a mixed bag, about a 6 on 10. As far as Bond girls go, Lois Shiles has the dubious honor of playing the Bond girl with the most leeringly inappropriate name in screen history, Dr. Holly Goodhead. Wink, 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 wink. I am looking for Dr. Goodhead. You just found her. I cannot believe this made it past the censors. It makes pussy galore look clean as a whistle. Sadly, Shiles is kind of bland in the part. She looks great, but doesn't deliver much to the film, and I find that her and Moore's chemistry, not great. I give the Bond girl about a six on 10. Bond music, however, now we're talking. John Barry is back and produces one of his best ever James Bond scores, and it's actually a much better score than the film deserves. It's like a classic space opera. He was doing this a lot though, back in the 70s. He did an Italian movie called Star Crash that's awful, but the soundtrack is great. And same thing for The Black Hole, which of course I do have a soft spot for, but has this amazing score by John Barry. I mean, he was just damn good at the time. I also kind of like the nice theme song by Shirley Bassey, although the disco remix of it at the end is a little, uh. Score gets a nine on 10. Body count in this one is 14. James Bond kills quite a few people in this movie. Number of women Bond sleeps with in this, however, he does three women in this outing, including the gorgeous Corrine Clary, who sadly pays the ultimate price for her night of passion with 007, meaning, of course, that she gets devoured by a pack of hungry Doberman pictures. Ouch. The gadgets in this one are pretty cool. The laser guns are nifty, and there's a really cool wristwatch that Bond goes that shoots poison pellets and steel darts. That said, not much else in this movie besides that, although the whole film's kind of a gadget if you look at it. I mean, it's James Bond in space. There's also a couple nifty double entendres. In fact, the niftiest one comes from Q, because at the end of the movie you see M and Q and everybody, they catch Bond in the middle of doing some business in space, and then M goes, 007, what are you doing? And then Q says, I believe he's attempting re-entry, sir. Awesome. As I said, Moonraker is not my favorite Bond film, but I do have a soft spot for it, so I've gotta give it a six on 10. A lot of people would give it much, much lower, but there's something about Moonraker that I just can't help but kind of enjoy. And you know, Bond movies in some ways are a bit like sex, even when it's bad, it's still pretty good. And audiences, I guess, agreed with me, with Moonraker a smash hit, pulling in $70 million in the US, and a worldwide total of 211 million. So maybe it wasn't such a stupid idea to send Bond into space after all. Of course, he would come back down to earth on his next outing, but that's a story for another day. You missed Mr. Bond. Did I? In 1979, Moonraker opened to Boffo Box Office. The James Bond series' answer to the Star Wars phenomenon, the film broke box office records for the franchise, grossing over $200 million worldwide. However, the cost was a staggering $34 million. That's more than twice what The Spy Who Loved Me had cost. Here's a comparison. Star Wars in 1977 cost $10 million. Star Trek The Motion Picture, which was a notoriously pricey flop, cost $30 million. Moonraker cost even more. More? But it was also a huge hit. However, the studio behind the Bond films, United Artists, were in dire straits around the time the next Bond movie, For Your Eyes Only, was slated to begin production. 
They had pumped boatloads of cash into Michael Cimino's Heaven's Gate, which went on to become the costliest flop in film history. Hemorrhaging cash, they needed to cut down costs. Thus, the film would be scaled back somewhat and brought down to earth. That meant no more space. To that end, there would be a shakeup behind the scenes. Lewis Gilbert, who made The Spy Who Loved Me and Moonraker, would be replaced by John Glenn, formerly an editor and second unit director for the series. The writing job would go to Richard Maybaum, a Bond series veteran, with Michael G. Wilson, Albert R. Broccoli's stepson, joining on to co-write. Eventually, of course, Michael G. Wilson and Barbara Broccoli would go on to shepherd the Bond series through the 21st century. But what about Bond himself? Little known fact, Roger Moore's contract as James Bond was actually up by this point. He seemed ready to move on and even sent up Bond in the Cannonball Run, something which got him into hot water with Eon Films and resulted in a clause where no Bond actor could appear wearing a tux in a movie while under contract as 007. I'm Roger Moore. Ooh. Roger Moore. In later years, this would be a tricky thing for Pierce Brosnan to navigate while doing the Thomas Crown Affair. Many actors were considered to take Roger Moore's place. There was Lewis Collins, a British TV star who seemed like a frontrunner, but apparently didn't impress Albert R. Broccoli. Ian Ogilvy, who, like Moore, had played the saint, was also considered, but the guy who really came close to nailing the part was Michael Billington, who Eon set up with a publicity shoot and came very close to announcing his bond. But finally, Moore returned to the role at the 11th hour. The fact that the studio had to cut the budget back a little bit actually benefited the series. You see, after the Moonraker debacle, the franchise was in serious need of a reboot. Thankfully, the producers were all too aware of this fact, and the result is really one of the highlights of the Roger Moore era. I've always enjoyed this film. Now, I have to mention that the plot is extremely convoluted. The ATAC, which is a machine that the Russians want to capture, is a big MacGuffin. In the film, the Havelocks find the ATAC submerged, the Russians want it, so do the British, James Bond's after it, but along the way he runs into Melina Havelock, played by Carol Bouquet, whose parents were murdered by an assassin to get their hands on the ATAC. It kind of meanders, but it's a really well-constructed film. The action scenes are particularly good in this one, boasting some of the best stunt work in the series, and you can really feel that John Glenn's influence as a second unit director and editor is felt here. There's a great scene where Bond has to ski down a bobsled run, that's amazing, although tragically one of the stuntmen actually died filming this sequence. The casting is top notch, although the villains are a tad bland. John Glenn would become kind of the maestro of the James Bond series through the 80s. He would film every subsequent installment up until Timothy Dalton's swan song as 007, License to Kill. Special note should also be made of the opening teaser, which is much sillier than anything else in the film, and features the long-awaited demise of Ernst Stavro Blofeld, who is not named due to legal wrangling with Kevin McClory, but more on that in the Never's Never Again entry. Mr. Bond! Immediately, this undermines the serious tone of the film, but afterwards, the movie becomes pretty down to earth. Although I do really like the bit where Roger Moore, as Bond, visits his late wife Tracy's grave. I always enjoyed it when they would do scenes like this in the James Bond movies because you would get some sense of continuity that he was really playing the same character in each movie, despite the fact that the actors would change. Probably my biggest issue with For Your Eyes Only is the script. It's not bad, but like I said, it's convoluted, and the whole plot with the ATAC is, eh, fine. I give it about a 6 on 10. It's down to earth, it's somewhat slick, but it's really just an excuse for a lot of really good action scenes. But the action scenes are amazing, so I guess that's fine. I quite agree, sir. The thing that really works in this movie is Roger Moore. I think this is probably his best performance as James Bond. By the time the film came out in 1981, Roger Moore was 54, and his age is actually not downplayed in the film. Unlike other installments, here James Bond seems less interested in blowing things up and nailing every woman he sees. In fact, he actually turns down sex from Lynn Holly Johnson's character because she's way, 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 way too young for him. Yes, well, you get your clothes on. I'll buy you an ice cream. I kind of like this side of Roger Moore. Rather, he plays the character slightly world-weary. It starts off with him visiting Tracy's grave, and you see that there is a cost to his life as a super spy. Throughout the film, he's alternately cold-blooded and compassionate. There's a great scene where he cold-bloodedly murders the film's big assassin, which is badass, and apparently Roger Moore himself didn't actually want to do it, but really gives you the idea that James Bond could be a cold-blooded assassin if needed to be. <laughs> Thank you. 
But then there's also a great sequence where he tries to dissuade his leading lady from taking vengeance on the men who killed her parents. And I think this is probably some of the best acting Moore ever contributed to the series. Before setting out on revenge, you first dig two graves. It's really, really good, and his performance is awesome. The villains, though are a little bit weak. Julian Glover, who would eventually play the villain in Indiana Jones in The Last Crusade. Donovan, didn't I warn you not to trust anybody, Dr. Jones? And was actually tipped to play James Bond at one point in the 70s, plays Eris Christados, who is one of the blandest Bond villains ever. His ploy is to sell the ATAC machine to the Russians, and it's kind of boring, but in some ways, I think this might have been intentional. The filmmakers at the time were trying to steer the series away from megalomaniacal villains intent on taking over the world. Christados is just kind of a normal guy. The more interesting character in this is actually James Bond's ally, Columbo, played by Topol from Fiddler on the Roof. And I kind of think in some ways that if they had wanted the villain to be more explosive, they might have reversed the roles, as Topol has a lot of presence, almost too much to be playing a James Bond ally, while Glover just kind of disappears in the background. Cheers. Yes, sir. I should also mention that one of his henchmen is played by Charles Dance in his screen acting debut. Pretty cool. The Bond villains in this one, mm, a mediocre 6 on 10. As for the Bond girl, I really like Carol Bouquet in this movie as Melina Havelock. She's the toughest Bond girl in the series up to this point, even more so than Triple X. Basically, Havelock is on her own mission of vengeance, killing off all the men responsible for the brutal murder of her parents in the opening scene. Unlike a lot of the other Bond girls, though, there's a vulnerability to the character that really sets her apart, and this is one of the few times in the series where it feels like Bond actually really cares about his love interest. Amore, amore. Bouquet, of course, was dubbed for the role because she had a pretty thick French accent, but it's actually her voice on the French version of these films. Interesting side note, there's a part where they're submerged underwater, and Carol Bouquet had a really strange thing about water where she could not be underwater due to some kind of nasal issue. So, they're actually shot on a soundstage with artificial bubbles put in, so they're never actually underwater. I always thought that was kind of neat. Worth noting also is the fact that the film's other Bond girl, Countess Lizzle, is played by the late Cassandra Harris, who was actually married to Pierce Brosnan at the time. And legend has it that Brosnan was spotted by Broccoli while visiting Harris on the set of this film, and that Broccoli made a note of the actor's name for future consideration as James Bond. And well, we all know how that worked out. Another factoid about the Bond girls in this outing. One of the scantily clad extras during the pool scene in the first act was a trans actress named Tula. This became quite the scandal once the film came out, even though Tula is only featured fleetingly in a couple of shots. And I have to say, she's beautiful. The Bond girls in this movie, I would say, get a strong 9 on 10. The Bond music, however, is another issue in this film. Now, it does have a great opening theme song, perhaps one of the best by Sheena Easton, For Your Eyes Only. This is one that often makes my Spotify playlist. And Sheena Easton is so beautiful that Maurice Binder, who would always do these opening credits, was so taken with how she looked, she becomes the only Bond singer to actually perform the song on screen. And in fact, the opening credits for this were released as a music video in 1981. The score itself, though, is not very good. It's by Bill Conti, who was famous at the time for doing the Rocky music, but it's pretty schlocky and one of the few real problems with the movies. It's kind of disco-tinged at time and feels like something off of, you know, a silly 80s action show like the A-Team. It's the only thing about the movie I think that really dates it. The Bond music in this gets a 5 on 10, although I would personally give Sheena Easton's James Bond song for your eyes only a strong 10 on 10. It really is one of my favorites of the series. The Bond body count in this one is pretty high. He takes out 13 baddies in the film, including one of his most cold-blooded slayings ever when he boots a car over a cliff after the driver kills one of his allies. The number of women Bond sleeps with in this one is actually scaled back quite a bit from Moonraker. He only sleeps with two ladies in this go-round, and you know, I think it was kind of due to the fact that Roger Moore was getting a little bit old. Couldn't just be jumping into the sack with every woman he sees. I kind of like this. There are some great one-liners, however, even if the movie is much more down-to-earth. There's a really cool part where James Bond has a close call with a shark, and he says, I hope he was dining alone. Q also gets a really good one. You see, James Bond walks into a Greek confessional booth where Q is disguised as a priest. Bond says, Forgive me, Father, for I have sinned. And Q says, That's putting it mildly, 007. There's some good double entendres as well, although he's actually fairly PC. Cheers. Bottoms up. The Bond gadgets are also scaled way back. The Lotus makes a very brief appearance, but it's painted a disgusting shade of copper. Ugh. 
1981, how could you? Although, then again, I was born in 81, so I guess the year's fine. James Bond just basically uses that as a car and doesn't blow any helicopters or anything. So the gadgets are laid back, although there's this weird machine that Q uses to make profiles of people that, ugh, it's just so dated. The reception to this movie was pretty good. Despite being a much more earthbound film, For Your Eyes Only was almost as successful as Moonraker at the box office, grossing $195 million worldwide. Although, it must be said, the film actually underperformed in the US where it made $54 million, which is a very solid number, but still $16 million less than Moonraker. But the year, of course, was 1981, and it had some pretty heavy competition from movies like Raiders of the Lost Ark, Superman 2, and stripes. A feast for my eyes. Overall, I'd give this Roger Moore James Bond outing a strong 9 on 10. It really is one of my favorites. Now, 1983 would be one of the craziest years for James Bond ever because it would be the only year we'd ever get two James Bond movies coming out at once. You see, Sean Connery would be returning for Never Sin Ever Again, so the producers would have to go all out in their next installment, Octopussy. But of course, that's a story for another time. For your eyes only, darling. In 1981, For Your Eyes Only hit theaters. Unlike some of the previous films, this was more of an attempt to ground the series and take it away from the campy direction it had been heading towards throughout the 70s, exemplified, most notoriously, by Moonraker. The film was a worldwide success, and work quickly began on the next film, Octopussy. An aging Roger Moore, however, had decided that he'd had enough playing James Bond, and he actually retired from the role. So the search was on for a replacement. After testing several actors, including Lewis Collins, who was famous off The Professionals, the decision was made to go with none other than James Brolin. Yes, American James Brolin, father of Josh Brolin. Yes, he's an American, but he actually aced his screen test, which you can actually watch on the Octopussy DVD and Blu-ray. Also helping matters was the fact that Brolin was able to affect a certain mid-Atlantic accent, which made him somewhat easier to accept as a British agent. If you watch his screen test, it's actually not half bad. He nails the action scenes, nails the seduction scenes, and looks cool in a suit. He almost played James Bond. The contracts were about to be signed, but then some really, really, really big news broke. Sean Connery, the definitive James Bond, had been signed to star in Never Say Never Again, a rival Bond film produced through Warner Brothers, which was the result of a complicated legal battle between producer Kevin McClory and Cubby Broccoli. But of course, more on that in the next installment. Knowing that there was no way that James Brolin could compete with Sean Connery, Cubby Broccoli managed to convince Roger Moore to once again slip on his tux. In the film, which was co-written by George MacDonald Frazier, famous for the Flashman series, 007 investigates the murder of a British agent and stumbles upon a smuggling ring with ties to a renegade Russian general intent on starting nuclear war with the West. Now, people are going to give me a lot of grief for this particular installment of James Bond Revisited. For some reason, everybody remembers Octopussy as being one of the lesser James Bond movies, but in my opinion, they're wrong. You see, I love Octopussy. In fact, I'd wager it's probably one of my favorite James Bond movies of all time. Is it a good film? Critically, I can look at it and say, probably not. I mean, there's a lot of silliness in Octopussy. You know, James Bond dresses up as a clown. He infiltrates the circus. I'm deadly serious. I'm a British agent. What? He swings from rope to rope in the jungle with the Tarzan yell. He tells a tiger to sit. There's a lot of weird, weird, weird stuff in this movie. And it's juvenile, but I can't help but love this film. You see, it was the second James Bond film I ever saw on the ABC Saturday Night Movie. And, well, I just watched it over and over again as a kid, and it's become this kind of elemental part of my DNA, I suppose. Octopussy is simply one of the transformative movies for me. 
I can really understand why some people hate this film, and it has inarguable flaws, but the film is just damn fun to watch. When For Your Eyes Only came out in 1981, it was a box office success, but in North America it wasn't anywhere near as big as Moonraker. It got its ass kicked by Raiders of the Lost Ark, and it's obvious that the filmmakers behind this one, which include returning director John Glenn, must have studied that film before starting work on Octopussy, as they imbue this film with the same kind of pulpy cliffhanger energy that was really in every frame of Raiders of the Lost Ark and was pretty common in some of the Indiana Jones clones of the time. And of all the Bond films up to this point, I'd say that Octopussy probably has the most action. The film starts with a crazy mini jet chase and the pace never lets up for one second. Over the next two hours, we get a wild chase through a crowded Indian market featuring sword swallowers, fire breathers, jugglers, etc, etc, a tiger hunt with Bond as the bait, a crazy battle involving a buzzsaw yo-yo that I thought was the coolest thing ever when I was 10 years old, Bond fighting killers above and below a train, a car chase with Bond driving on the tracks, James Bond dressed as a clown, and finally a wild palace shootout where Bond fights alongside a legion of scantily clad women, with Q offering air support from a hot air balloon. I mean, I don't know about No Time to Die, but I don't think it'll be anywhere near as cool as Octopussy, right? I mean, Q in a hot air balloon? Come on, it's the greatest. So one of the things that people kind of attack this movie for is the script by George MacDonald Frazier, which I must admit is a bit silly, but I kind of like it. You see, in the early 80s, the West was in kind of Cold War hysteria. Reagan was president and, you know, nuclear war with Russia was a real threat. Movies like The Day After came out and scared the crap out of people. So it's not a surprise that this film in some ways does demonize Russia with Stephen Burkhoff, who always played these kind of villains in the 80s, playing the diabolical Russian general who wants to, you know, destroy the West. How he ends up getting involved with a circus run by Maud Adams Octopussy and Louis Jordan's Kamal Khan stretches things a little bit, but I think it's fun. As an excuse to frame action scenes, Octopussy kind of works. It's not one of the more serious Bond movies, in fact it's probably one of the silliest Bond movies, but I really like it and I like the screenplay. So I give it about a 7 on 10. It's fun. It's the kind of thing that would make for a good airport read. Now. As this is one of the more lighthearted James Bond movies, I have to say Roger Moore really fits into the part. Now, he's 56 at this point, which I think we'll all admit was a little bit over the hill. Roger Moore, God bless him, probably stuck around too long as James Bond, but it's not as bad here as it is in A View to a Kill two years later. He still looks reasonably fit, gets his shirt off, looks pretty good, and actually has really good chemistry with Maude Adams. She's only about 20 years younger than him, which in Bond Girl math is actually not too bad. Makes her an age-appropriate love interest, I guess, which is kind of strange. Also, Roger Moore seems to be having a good time with Desmond Llewellyn, who he kept pushing to get more screen time, so in this entry, Q has a fairly substantial role. Roger Moore looks like he's enjoying himself, and in his biography said that it was one of the most fun James Bond films to shoot, so that's cool. Roger Moore aces Bond in this one. Although that said, he's doubled a lot by his stuntman. Now, there are two significant villains in this movie. The first is Louis Jardin, who was actually a former song and dance man for MGM. Ever see Gigi? Yes, he's the heart-throbbing Gigi. Jardin has one of the best voices in cinema history, this really cool kind of French accent, although I don't know why this makes him a guy who should play an Indian character. But hearing him say the name Octopussy, Octopussy, over and over again, kind of makes the film worth watching, right? Octopussy, Octopussy. The character is a little bland though. I think he's supposed to be an Afghani prince or something, but I don't know, it doesn't really make much sense. Steven Burkhoff, who as I mentioned was the quintessential 80s stock villain, pops up here and there as the mad General Orloff and does indeed have threat. He has these crazy eyes and this mole in the middle of his head that you know really freaked me out as a kid. I thought it was like a third eye. And he's definitely menacing enough to be a credible secondary villain. I actually think of all the villains, probably Kabir Betty, who's a huge star in Bollywood, has the most memorable screen time as Kamal Khan's heavy. He looks really cool, and I like it when he crushes the dice in his hands. It's pretty neat. The villains, I would say, are probably about a 7 on 10. Bond Girl, however, one of my favorites. I give her a 10 on 10. Maud Adams is Octopussy, and this is actually her second go-round, having previously appeared as Scaramanga's doomed girlfriend in The Man with the Golden Gun. Maud Adams is great, looks good with Roger Moore, as she was, I guess, closer to his age than some other Bond girls of the era, but, you know, not really. She also gets in on the action and is kind of a fun character. I like Octopussy's backstory where her father was a British agent and wants to thank Bond for giving him the chance to, you know, do the honorable thing, you know, kill himself, rather than go to jail. 
I like the relationship, I like her romance with Moore, and I think she's also pretty good in the action scene. She's a really good Bond girl. I'd give her a 10 on 10. The Bond music. This is where the movie really excels. John Barry is back after having taken off For Your Eyes Only, and contributes one of his best scores. It sounds probably more like an Indiana Jones score than a James Bond score, but it's really good. I think it's one of his best. I've also always had kind of a soft spot for the theme song All Time High by Rita Coolidge, even though a lot of people kind of mock it as having that early 80s adult contemporary sound. Whatever, I like it. And you know what? It even got a shout out in Seth MacFarlane's TED. Due to the high action quotient, this film has a massive body count. All in all, James Bond takes out 78 baddies. 78, really? Wow, that seems like a lot for a James Bond movie. But anyway, well, what can you do? Roger Moore, however, was getting on in age, and at 56, I suppose it's understandable that the number of women Bond sleeps with in this film has reduced somewhat. He only sleeps with two women. What a shock. I should mention though, one of the girls is Christina Wayborn, who's Octopussy second in command, and she's gorgeous. And by the way, for Bond allies, keep an eye out for Vijay Armitraj, the famous tennis player, as his sidekick, Vijay, who, of course, is also a tennis player in the film and beats people up with his racket. It's pretty awesome. The gadgets in this movie are pretty cool. Q issues Bond a neat fountain pen, which consists of a vial of acid as opposed to ink, to which Bond naturally replies, wonderful for poison pen letters. There's some really good one-liners in this movie. There's a great scene where he's being pursued through the jungle by Kamal Khan and his men, and Bond manages to escape to a nearby river where he catches a ferry full of tourists. By this point, Bond's been pretty badly beat up and looks terrible after having been attacked by tarantulas, tigers, bats, etc. When one of the women asks James Bond if he's with their tour, he manages a classic, no ma'am, I'm with the economy group, while raising an eyebrow. Classic. There's also kind of a mean double entendre when James Bond goes to Q Branch and he sees this rope that kind of is mechanized, the Indian rope trick, you know, from movies where it's mechanized and it malfunctions and then Bond says to Q, having trouble getting it up, Q? I mean, really, that's not very nice. Q's an older man. I mean, maybe he does have a little trouble. I don't know. I always thought this scene at the end where all the girls carry Q off in their arms was kind of strange because it looks like, I don't know, Q's heading towards a massive orgy? Strange. Oh, cut it out! We haven't time for that. Oh. Later, perhaps. So as far as James Bond movies go, it's hard for me to grade this one on 10. I know that people have taken issue with some of my grades in the past. Some have said that I was too hard on the movies. Some have said I wasn't hard enough. Octopussy is one that I think people will have a hard time reckoning my grade with. But I have to say, Octopussy is simply one of my favorite movies from when I was a kid. Critically, I'd probably give this like a 6 on 10, but you know, nostalgically, I have to give it a 10. What can I say? It's one of my favorite Bonds. I love it. Sue me. Now, despite the fact that everybody has always said they prefer Sean Connery to Roger Moore, it's worth noting that Octopussy actually ended up outgrossing Never Say Never Again by over $20 million. You see, Octopussy was a huge hit in the summer of 1983, pulling in $57 million in North America despite heavy competition from movies like Return of the Jedi, Trading Places, War Games, Blue Thunder, and Flashdance. Worldwide, it pulled in $187 million. So I guess I'm not the only one that likes Octopussy. Octopussy is a great James Bond movie. I kind of wish that they'd make another James Bond movie like this, one that's just fun. I'd love to see Daniel Craig crack a smile as James Bond. I feel like he never does. It's just a fun James Bond movie and one of the reasons I really loved the series as a kid. So, sue me. But of course, 1983 was the year of the great James Bond face-off, and this story wouldn't be complete with going into Never Say Never Again. So join us next time on James Bond Revisited as we take a look at that often forgotten piece of James Bond lore, Never Say Never Again, a chapter in James Bond history that the producers don't like to talk about for obvious reasons, and we'll get all into it next time. Hey everybody and welcome back to James Bond Revisited and now I have the sad duty to close out my beloved Roger Moore era with his final entry into the series of You to a Kill. Now, 
Roger Moore was famously ready to leave the James Bond franchise after For Your Eyes Only, but he was enticed to come back for the follow-up Octopussy because it was going up against Sean Connery's Never Say Never Again at the box office. And audiences worldwide actually preferred Octopussy to Never Say Never Again, with it making significantly more money at the box office. So clearly audiences still loved Roger Moore in the role. So as a result, Eon Pictures enticed him back for yet another James Bond movie, although he was now 58 years old and would be doubled heavily throughout a movie that many James Bond fans think he was just too old to ever do. When we look back at Roger Moore as James Bond, I think people's ageism does come out a little bit. People always say that he was too old to play James Bond. I don't think he was too old to play James Bond. I think the problem with Roger Moore as James Bond was that he was playing James Bond as ostensibly a guy in his 30s. If they had acknowledged Roger Moore's age more like they did in For Your Eyes Only, I think people would have had a much easier time accepting him as the role went on. The problem with A View to a Kill is that he's paired up with Tanya Roberts, who's about 30 years younger than him. Roger Moore in his biography, which appropriately is titled My Wood is My Bond, actually said that he was older than Tanya Roberts' mother when he was making this movie, and that's what told him he had to leave the part. Now, looking at this movie, it's clear that Roger Moore, before he did View to a Kill, might have been worried about his age and elected to have a little bit of plastic surgery. He may have denied this over the years, but if you look around his eyes, clearly something's been done and his mole is gone. The famous Roger Moore mole has been removed. I love that mole. I mean, that mole is what made James Bond for me. Mole. Anyway. Getting back to A View to a Kill, it is a movie that I think people have kind of come around to over the years. It was widely mocked when it came out, but there's something of a cult around it. In fact, it was recently celebrated on How Did This Get Made, and, you know, my own fiancé says that it's probably her favorite James Bond film, just because it's so silly and so much fun to watch. I got to see it in 4K at a Cineplex flashback screening some years ago, before, you know, the world shut down and movie theaters were still a thing, and A View to a Kill really does hold up. It's a lot of fun. Now, in this one, James Bond goes up against a Silicon Valley microchip magnet named Max Zorin, played by none other than Christopher Walken, with ties to the KGB. Now, as much as I loved Octopussy, I'll be the first to admit that Moore really probably should have left the series after wrapping that film. I think it would have been an excellent swan song and would have sent him out on a high note. In the DVD commentary of this, Roger Moore acknowledges over and over again that he should have sat this one out, and he's always said that it's his least favorite James Bond movie. And it's almost unintentionally funny watching Roger Moore in the film, as he kind of comes across as a little bit lecherous. Again, a problem with the fact that his leading lady is something like 30 years younger than him. He's not as suave as he was in previous installments. Also, it has to be said, Roger Moore is doubled a lot in this movie. Like, a lot. I think he might have just shown up to do his close-ups, otherwise he's barely in the film. The beginning of the movie where he's skiing in Siberia, I mean... I don't think Roger Moore was ever on location. He's got a close-up that they throw him in, and then when he gets on the iceberg boat to seduce the girl who's like 20, yeah, it's Roger Moore because, you know, he'll do those scenes. But the ski chase, yeah, I don't think there's much Roger Moore there except for a couple of grunts that they dubbed into the soundtrack where he goes, ooh, and ah, in the classic Roger Moore way. That said, Roger Moore is really not the only problem with A View to a Kill. It's never going to be remembered as one of the better entries in the series, and I think the fact is it's kind of an unimaginative outing. The filmmakers, I think, were trying to recapture the magic of Goldfinger in this film, but what they did is they replaced gold with microchips. Now, that's kind of forward-thinking, I guess, because, you know, computers and Silicon Valley be did become a big thing, and at the time it was kind of cutting edge, but, I mean, it's fairly silly and second-rate at times. There are some good action scenes, including a parachute jump off the Eiffel Tower, but otherwise, I don't think it really holds up as the most dynamic James Bond movie, although it's certainly a lot of fun, and it has a great soundtrack. So let's get into this movie a little bit. Everything that's wrong with Roger Moore in this film, as I said before, can be summed up by the opening teaser, where we get this really amazing action sequence, which is probably the best in the film, but we barely see Roger Moore's face because he was doubled for almost the entire thing. What's worse is when they finally do reveal his face and he's hitting on the girl that looks like she could be his granddaughter, she doesn't seem attracted to him, which is crazy for a Bond movie. I mean, he's James Bond. He's hot. Now, for Bond to work as a lady killer, he has to be believably attracted to women, and I think that 
Roger Moore at this point was just a little bit too old. They should have made the women in these films a little bit older, and I think it would have gone over a lot better. He just didn't come off in this one as an action star or a ladies' man, and he feels kind of ancient in the role, which is funny because if you look at him 10 years later, actually 12 years later in The Quest, he looks a lot more fit and he looks a lot more into the action, even opposite somebody like Jean-Claude Van Damme, who's over 30 years younger than him. I think at this point, Roger Moore was just kind of getting tired of the part. And it's a real shame this was his last James Bond movie because he deserved to go out on a higher note. And I think that Octopussy, as much as some people have problems with it, would have fit the bill perfectly. Now, the screenplay in this one, as I said before, is lazy, so it gets kind of a 5 on 10. It's a lot of Michael G. Wilson's writing involved with Richard Maybaum, and it's not one of their best outings. The villains. This is a controversial one. Now, people love Christopher Walken. I love Christopher Walken. But... When Christopher Walken did A View to a Kill, he wasn't quote-unquote Christopher Walken, or at least not the scenery-showing Christopher Walken that we know nowadays. I believe that that Christopher Walken was born when he did King of New York. In this one, he's just kind of, you know, along for the ride. He's fine, but I don't think that he's one of the classic James Bond villains, although he's got fantastic hair in this movie. I mean, the movie is all about his hair. Walken does his best to make the character work and seems amused by Roger Moore and also has a psychotic edge, which is pretty good. Although Roger Moore himself took issue with a scene where Zorin's just mowing down all of his employees in a mine shaft, saying that it was probably the most violent scene in a James Bond movie up to that point, and he thought it was overkill. It's funny because I kind of love to see Walken come back and play a James Bond villain again. For him, I give him about a 7 on 10. Wow, what a view to a kill. But my favorite villain in the movie is definitely Grace Jones as Mayday, his henchwoman. Now, as much as Christopher Walken is kind of, I don't know if I'd say he's necessarily phoning it in, but seems, you know, not super engaged, Grace Jones is having the time of her life, is delighting being the bad girl, and is really physically fit. I mean, when you see her go up against Roger Moore, I really think that, you know, Grace Jones could have kicked his ass. I mean, she was chiseled in this movie and really brings a lot of menace to the part. But then at the end, when Mayday actually kind of becomes good, she brings a lot of pathos to the part, especially when she sees Alison Doty's Jenny Flex lying dead in a pool of water. She has this agonized cream of Jenny that I think actually really works. She really does care about these people. And I think the problem with Mayday is she was always a misfit and felt that Zorin was her family. And when he betrays her, her hurt is palpable, so that makes her transition to being a Bond ally at the end of the movie quite powerful. It's weird, when I was younger, I used to not like her so much in the part because I thought she was too much, but now I think she really kind of saves the movie. I love Grace Jones in this, and you should check out some of her music. Grace Jones really rocks. I'd give her a 10 on 10. Now the Bond girls, the late Tanya Roberts is absolutely beautiful, but they do not do much with her in this movie, I have to say. Her Stacey Sutton is pretty bland. She's a beautiful woman, but it's a nothing role. And the filmmakers don't even really give her a chance to be sexy as she wears all these big boxy 80s style blouses with big shoulder pads. In fact, when I said earlier that Roger Moore said that her mother was younger than him, in fact, she was only 45 years old, which was the age that Roger Moore was when he started playing James Bond in Live and Let Die. I mean, yeah, I could see why that would maybe put a chip on his shoulder. So for Bond Girls, I give her a 6 on 10, although I really don't think this is Tanya Roberts' fault. She's beautiful. If you really want to see her at her best, check out The Beastmaster, check out Sheena, or check out that 70s show. She's great. Now, Bond music. Now we're talking. John Barry is back to provide a memorable James Bond score, and he gives it kind of an 80s new wave sound, which surprisingly doesn't sound dated at all. I think that Barry was really good to jumping onto these cutting edge trends. And I have to say, the theme song by Duran Duran is one of the best of the whole series. I like the soundtrack a lot, I'd give it a 10 on 10. In fact, I sometimes listen to it on Spotify, just cause it's kind of kick ass. The body count. Funny enough, Bond actually only kills two people in this movie, but it's still one of the more violent James Bond movies because Watkins Zorin is psychotic and not only mows down his employees, but also has a couple of scenes where he murders people in really grotesque ways. Like this one part where he puts a spy down an engine and he just gets shredded by a propeller. I remember thinking that was pretty hardcore when I was a kid. And yeah, it's still pretty hardcore nowadays. Now, Bond sleeps with a lot of women in this movie. And if James Bond was a little bit over the hill, he was still taking his Viagra because, you know, that's, that's four women in this movie. It's pretty good. Not bad for Roger Moore. In some ways, I think his best chemistry is with Fiona Fullerton, who plays Pola Ivanola a KGB agent who actually really seems turned on by Roger Moore, so I feel like she should have been the leading lady in this movie. Now, there's not a ton of great one-liners in this movie, but Christopher Walken gets off a good one when he drops a tycoon out of a blimp and says, so, anyone else want to drop out? There is, however, a really gross double entendre 
where James Bond has a meeting with Max Zorin just after having slept with Mayday, and Zorin asks him, you slept well? And Bond says, a little restless, but I got off eventually. I think we all know what he's talking about, right? And it's kind of gross. Now, there are some terrible gadgets in this movie. There are some x-ray glasses that Roger Moore wears at one point that are the most hilarious thing I've ever seen. I mean, if he's trying to be undercover at a party and he's got these massive lenses that he has to adjust and hold into place, eh, it's not really working. There's also like a Rocky IV style robot that Q is using at the end to spy on James Bond uh, while he's having sex with Stacey Sutton in the shower. And it's a little bit weird. And I think Q seems to be a bit of a peeper, right? Now, this isn't one of the better James Bond films, but it actually did pretty well at the box office. It made about $49 million in the US and $152 million worldwide, but significantly, it was about $30 million less than Octopussy when you consider worldwide sales. So they did decide at this point that they were gonna recast the part, and I really think it was time. Roger Moore, as good as he was as James Bond, and I really do think that he was amazing as James Bond, and he's probably my nostalgic favorite, really needed to step down at this point, and they made the right choice. They opened the door for a whole new era in James Bond movies, which we're gonna get into on our next installment, but it wasn't as easy a transition as some may have thought. Until next time, this is A View to a Kill, which gets about a 006 on 10. I like this movie, I don't hate it like other people do, but I must admit it's not one of the best James Bond movies ever. See you next time with The Living Daylights. Mole.